Bueno, buenas tardes. Vamos a, vamos a ir empezando. Eh, si se puede evitar al máximo entrar y salir del aula, trataremos de ser breves y no muy abstractos. Entonces, por favor, siéntense y aunque sea en una hora estemos, estemos en el sitio. Vamos a empezar la última sesión del día con Frederic Lordón y Evgeny Morozov. A Frederic le gusta definirse como un antes economista, ahora filósofo. Eh, de, de Evgeny podríamos decir algo similar, eh, intelectual público, una década o más investigando las tecnologías digitales. Lordón es uh, actualmente investigador del CSE, eh, tiene bastantes libros traducidos al castellano, acabamos de traducir en, en verso libros vivir sin, aunque si me preguntáis el libro de referencias capitalismo de soy y servidumbre, editado por Tinta de Limón, eh, también eh, interviene en Le Monde Diplomatique eh, todo tipo de artículos sobre la izquierda europea, sobre, sobre las derivas autoritarias y sobre todo sobre las políticas de Francia. Evgeny Muchas personas que de aquí le conoceréis. Eh, tiene dos libros, La locura del solucionismo tecnológico y el desengaño de Internet, pero os recomiendo que acudáis a los podcasts que ha producido recientemente, A Sense of Rebellion, y de Santiago Bois. También trabaja en un libro eh, sobre teorías críticas del capitalismo y nuevas formas de entender el, el socialismo, que verá la luz pronto. Y nada, eh, no, quiero, no quiero tomar más, más espacio. Simplemente decir que este evento ha sido co-curado con Tecnopolítica y Verso Libros, que de aquí saldrá un libro eh, que se puede comprar ya, eh, que está ahí junto a otros libros de la editorial. Y nada, nada más, gracias por la, por la asistencia y espero que, que disfrutéis de la sesión. C'est moi, moi qui commence I, I start yeah, Ok, ok. Uh, thank you so much, EK8, for this very nice invitation, and thank you to all the decidim people for their wonderful organization. Um, I'm afraid you, you're not going to be paid back adequately because before getting started, I had to confess something. I'm a bad guest. You know? And what do bad guests do? Well, essentially, they misbehave. You know, They put their feet on the table, they blow their nose in the curtain, they misbehave. That, that's what I do. I can't, I can't help misbehaving. Sorry about that. And uh, so what does this mean for you today? This means that uh, uh, I come here with the intent to shock you. <laughs> Uh, to tell you things you might not want to hear, things that might be unpalatable to you, possibly outrageous, but things I believe that are quite necessary to be told, so as to get rid of political illusions which leave the left in an ideological stalemate. I mean the real left, you know, not the bogus fake left, not your PSOE, uh, our party socialist, new labor, and, and their likes. So, uh, apology number two, what I'm going to say now might seem somewhat disconnected from uh, Yevgeny's talk and from the general topic of this session. Actually, I don't think it is. Uh, we're all revolving around the same questions. I just catch, catch them by a particular end. By the way, suggested by the very statements of Decidim itself, participatory democracy and ecological transition. I've just seen that you have had a session about that this morning. Too bad, I'm sorry about that too. So now, my nose in the curtain. Participatory democracy and ecological transition. It seems to me this is quite a questionable wording, I'm afraid, and that's what I would like to discuss now. Ecological transition first. I'm not going to beat around the bush. This is a capitalist syntagm. These are the words of capitalism. Thinking, speaking of something like ecological transition conveys the subtext that we are going to fix. It's a very characteristic word, fix. It's like adapt. It should always ring a bell. We're going to fix the ecological issue, and that we, are, we will do so here is implicit, of course, without getting out of capitalism. That there is a fix to the little unpleasant ecological dirt, but a fix within capitalism. And if what I come here for had to be summarized in one and only one sentence, it would be that this assumption is entirely false. It is dramatic, 
cliff falls. Why that? Back to basics. When it comes to capitalism, basics are historical materialistic, Marxist. The capital, in Marx's sense, is a, log is a logic enshrined in social structures. This logic, as you know, is making money with money, is money indefinitely augmenting itself, but through the mediation of production. The important word here is indefinitely. The capitalist logic of endogenous self-sustained accumulation does not contain inner, any inner limitation, any restoring force. Left to their logic, capitalists won't stop before having extracted the, last, the very last drop of oil, the very last kilo of ore, before having dried up the very last groundwater. They just won't stop until the entire exhaustion of any natural resource. So at that point, you could object. True, the capitalist logic knows no inner limitations. However, we can impose some, and that's what politics stands for. After all, didn't the capital have historically to pass compromises? Didn't the labor forces, the unions, succeed in getting pay rises, better working conditions, reductions in working time, social transfers, and so on. And that was the very essence of social democracy. Why not just extending this social democratic logic so as to tame the capitalist logic with respect to the new ecological issue? Why not? Simply because social democracy is dead, definitively dead. If it seems to survive in the ballots, it's a zombie. It's a walking dead. You know, it's like the, the light you receive from an already dead star. And that's the point which deserves the utmost attention. Social and political compromises don't come out of nowhere. They don't fall from the skies. They are no godsend, or in a more secular way, they have nothing to do with goodwill, good faith, cooperation, or benevolence. It's all about forces and balances of forces. However, balances of forces are entirely determined by the social structures the protagonists are striving in. From one structural configuration to another, the balance of force can be dramatically modified, possibly entirely reversed. That's just what is going on since the end of the 70s. Capitalism has ushered into a brand new accumulation regime. Let's call it neoliberalism. It's a completely new era in the history of capitalism, particularly in comparison with the previous Fordist accumulation regime. I can't enter the details of this great transition. I just give the bottom line. Whereas the Fordist accumulation regime gave bargaining power to the labor and left room for compromises, none of this exists any longer in the neoliberal capitalism, mostly due to the overwhelming power of finance, especially shareholder finance. With all the power of these new structures on their sides, Capitalists have no longer any interest to compromise. They just can go it alone, and that's what they do. They have become an unstoppable force. They bully employees. They brutally impose their views on the entire society. They stop themselves like pigs in a trough. There is no other reason to the obscene explosion in equalities. And there is no explanation as well to a foretold ecocide. Capitalists just don't give a shit anymore. Now left to themselves, obeying no one but themselves, severed from the rest of the society, capitalists will go to the very end of the end, the last drop, the last kilo, the last liter. Have no doubt about that. Anyone who wants to get involved in politics under the overhang of climate change has to face this harsh truth.
Any other assumption is entirely delusional. So what can be expected then from participatory democracy in the light of this analysis? This now should be regarded as a rhetorical question, if not a joke. Can you seriously believe that citizens' gatherings and participatory democracy can curb the capitalist accumulation? Can you imagine that they can dent the wild, limitless appetite for, for profits for the sake of ecological considerations? No, you can't, or you're dreaming with open eyes. As we have now deeply ushered into neoliberal capitalism, there is no room left for compromises, be they social or ecological. Even if came back by miracle a CEO sincerely concerned by ecological questions, the shareholder monitoring would severely thwart any deviation from the return on equity targets and manage to get the undisciplined CEO fired if he had the unfortunate idea to, pay, to persevere. Well, you could say, let's bypass the capitalists and bring our legitimate concerns to the political decision makers. Don't they get the real, the last resort power? No, they don't. Or if they do, it is only to exert it as stewards of capitalist interests. Let me give you an example. A great participatory convention around clim climate change has taken place in France, initiated by the government. Macron promised he would retain all the propositions the great convention would deliver. Guess what? He retained none, none, nada, zilch. It all went to trash. So just like capitalists, political decision makers don't give a shit to the IPCC reports which one after another are ringing wake-up calls more and more loudly. The UN explains that humanity is on a wrecked course. Heads of state turn a blind eye. So now it's time that some climate activists stop whining that the decision makers do not listen to us. Of course they don't. They're not the last resort solution. They're the fucking last resort problem. If by another miracle came a head of state determined to take a significant course of action against climate change, that is to say, set to him to impose hard constraints on the capital, the capitalists would wage a relentless war against him until he bows or until he is terminated. Financial market storms, billionaire-owned medias campaigning around the clock, industrial sabotage and lockouts, the capitalist arsenal is more than sufficient to break any political leader who would threaten the unabated power capitalists are now used to. Think of what happened to Chile in 1973. In a less dramatic form, think to what happened to Tsipras and Syriza in Greece. That would be exactly the same if Mélenchon ca came into power in France. So we can now measure exactly the realm of participatory democracy. I'm afraid it's a pinhead which doesn't extend far beyond local issues, possibly some global ones, provided they leave capitalist interests untouched. Back to ecological transition. We now know it's not very promising either. It's basically a sham, aimed at persuading that there is no need to question capitalism. Innovation will set it all right. You know, in the capitalism, innovation is the joker. Have any problem, innovation will solve it. By the way, isn't innovation the great thing of capitalism? The almost entire production of Hollywood is dedicated to put that idea deep in your heads. It's a permanent display of the baffling powers of the wonders of technology. Then be trustful. Trust innovation. It will deliver on time. No, it won't. This is a lie. This is a goddamn fraud. The planet Earth is finite. The capital accumulation is limitless. No innovation whatsoever 
can sort this out, because it's close to logical contradiction. Techno-solutionism is the latest capitalist bullshit to make you believe that it would be madness to break with capitalism when it always has a solution. Well, this is a deadly illusion. Drop it down now, or the awakening will be painful. Drop it down now, then be consistent. If you get me right, you must yourself come to the conclusion. The choice that lies ahead is between ecocide and capitalocide. Shall we remain in the capitalism? Then we will have an ecocide. More than that, in fact, we will have an anthropocide. Even if covered with oil, garbage, drowned lands, or deserts everywhere else, the planet Earth still will be the planet Earth. By the way, rather trust nature to prevail again eventually, after mankind will have disappeared. No, the ultimate catastrophe does not concern the planet in the first place. It's about us as a species. So, either anthropocide or capitalocide, there is no solution away from anthropocide but killing capitalism. If you want to avoid anthropocide, and please read my lips, then there is no alternative. Sounds familiar, I guess. There is no alternative but return to sender, right? If not anthropocide, there is no alternative. It has to be capitalocide. So does this analysis leave us in a state of despair, even deprived of words, if ecological transition and participatory democracy can, cannot be trusted? Definitely not. We have been living for too long under Frederick Jameson's curse. It's easier to conceive the end of the world than the end of capitalism. There is no other relevant political agenda for the long term than the end of cap capitalism. The left, I mean the real left, has now to say it loud and clear. Yet the problem with the left, I mean the radical left, is that it is quite good at voicing what it stands against and rather sucks when, it's, when it comes to say what it stands for. After four decades of neoliberal tyranny, what is at stake now, especially faced with the emergency of ecocide, is to drop down the negativity tone or style. Negativity has a weak political traction. Rallying needs the positivity of a proposition. We have to stop saying that we are anti this, or anti-that. True, a left declaring itself anti-capitalist would already be a lovely thing. I mean, it would be a huge progress. Yet we have to move on further and say what we are pro, which means to positively assert, affirm. And now comes the moment of truth. And again, my feet on the table. Because there are not many concepts to positively rephrase the negative anti-capitalist. Actually, I can see only one. Communism. Having analyzed the deadlock of participatory democracy within capitalism, the flaws and frauds of ecological transition, and having consistently come to the conclusion that there's no way out of the disaster but killing capitalism, you must embrace communism. Well, here we are. I know what's running in your heads. Communism, Stalin, Cheka, Gulag, starvation, 10 million casualties. Isn't it? Right. It takes to be insane, you may think, to restore communism. Actually, no, it doesn't. It takes to think both logically and historically. Historically, the idea of communism has nothing to do with this gruesome and tragic history we all know. What has been committed under the name of communism cannot even remotely be associated with the idea of communism. Tell us what this idea is, then. If only I had one hour or two. Among many other things, communism, I mean genuine communism, just means democracy. True, 
complete democracy, democracy everywhere, in every sphere of the collective life, starting with the sphere of production, where it has been radically banned. It's such a fraud in the end that capitalism had been associated with democracy when it's just the opposite. Bosses dictatorship inside the sweatshops, bogus democracy outside. Communism is a matter of sovereignty as a sheer synonym of democracy. Sovereignty democracy means that the concerned people not only have a say, they decide. They decide collectively for every matter of concern for them, especially in the sphere of production, where communism can be redefined as both the internal and external sovereignties of the workers on the division of labor. The internal sovereignty of workers deals with the way things are organized at the workplace. External sovereignty has to do with the way the division of labor is monitored and driven at the macroeconomic, macro-social level. What to produce, what do we need, what can we afford, of course, from an ecological standpoint, because this is now the paramount priority of all our political decisions. These issues are made a matter of collective deliberation in an adequate, adequate institutional setting. Whereas, as you know, the private capital decides alone to extend the division of labor in this or that direction, depending, depending only on what it considers fit to its profitability. Can you see how far we are from ecological transition and from participatory democracy as well? even if communism has to do with absolute radicalized democracy. Speaking of participatory democracy, now we know that eco what ecological transition should be replaced by. It should be replaced by communism. What should be the substitute for participatory democracy? Quite easy. <laughs> Revolution. Nobody can seriously believe that citizen gatherings or sit-ins will be up to the task of overthrowing the capitalist order. As a famous political figure once said, revolution is not a gala dinner. It's not a cakewalk. Revolution, and um, to push provocation a little bit further on, revolution, then Soviets. Provided you remember what Soviet means, councils deliberating assemblies, endowed with a full decision-making power. Revolution plus Soviets, communism as absolute democracy, this is just an horizon, of course, but this is an agenda. How extravagant it may look today, in the face of the destruction of humanity, I'm afraid this is the only one we have. Thank you for your time and having endured such an ugly talk. <laughs> Can I go? All right. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you so much for coming. And thanks so much for inviting us. It's uh, a pleasure and an honor to be debating with Frederic Lordon, whose work I've followed for quite a while and who's been uh, an inspiration. Um, I also find it a tough act to follow, uh, not least because normally I love to play the pessimist, and I guess I'll have to play the optimist now on this panel. <laughs> uh, and also because I like to shock, and you've been shocked enough, so I will find <laughs> It's somewhat challenging, but I'll try nonetheless. Um, and I think maybe since we do want it to be more of a dialogue, at least towards the end, maybe I will engage immediately with some of the things that uh, Frederick said, and will try to reframe my own contributions around them. And I think that at a very abstract level, uh, the disagreement that I see to emerge between us is that the way in which he defines communism as, um, of course, a necessary and desirable alternative to capitalism, which he defines along the lines of democracy, 
might not actually be the winning strategy for the left, mm -hmm. not least because capitalism doesn't claim to be delivering democracy anymore. And as long as it doesn't, saying that we'll get communism deliver us more democracy makes us compare apples and oranges. What does capitalism claim to deliver? I would argue that capitalism claims to deliver a number of things. Innovation, that it's the greatest disruptive creative system for producing new, for the new, the novelty. Uh, and it's a system that, in a way, allows individuals to step outside of the traditional social identities that have been imposed on them and experiment and try something new, whether as consumers or as entrepreneurs. That comes, of course, with all sorts of problems because you also need to inhabit the identity of the worker and so forth. I'm not justifying it. I'm just trying to maybe at this point articulate that the capitalist vision of emancipation passes not through giving all of us the desire, the ability to participate in Soviets and councils, but it comes from giving us the ability to shop for the widest variety of products on Amazon or go and secure venture capital funding and build an app that will satisfy some of our own needs or those of our community. And some of those uh, activities are meaningful. Uh, now, if that's because, you know, ultimately listening to, to Friedrich, the, the idea that kept creeping into my mind is that if everything really is as shitty as he claims, which I kind of agree that it is, and if social democracy is as that as it is, how come that capitalism still enjoys so much legitimacy? Um, and that, I think, is a question that so much, uh, so many people on the left have not been asking, thinking that the legitimacy of the capitalist system rests purely on some kind of brutal force and the fact that they own the means of production, and not on a softer set of factors, which, of course, we all, most of us know as cultural and political hegemony, which rests on intellectual factors and not just those having to do with brutal force. Now, if we were to put those two things together, one is that the fa one is capitalist legitimation, if you will, through the discourse of innovation and giving people the ability to experiment with themselves, their identities, their lifestyles, and their futures, and the need for socialism to articulate, or communism, to articulate a counter-project that will um, delegitimize this discourse of innovation, I think it points us only towards one plausible solution, which is showing that the capitalist system sucks at delivering what it does promise. And what it does promise is precisely the innovation, the reinvention, and the flexibility becoming fluidity and all the kind of stuff that capitalists and neoliberals in their more kind of progressive enlightened forms actually accept. You can go and read people who are outright reactionary like James Buchanan, and they would be quoting Whitehead on becoming, which you know, it's a pretty radical move for a neoliberal economist with a lot of radical economists on the left not even knowing who Whitehead is or was. Um, so that brings me to another point, which is that we, and I, and I, will, I will unpack that a little bit later uh, in, 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 in my intervention, what that counter project for the left would be. But I think before we get there, we need to understand that so many of us on the left are caught up in historical and intellectual narratives that seek to make sense of what happened in the past 60 or 70 years that themselves might be ripe for 
rethinking and reperiodization, if you will. Because I don't think it's correct for us to think that neoliberalism starts in 1970s and we are living in this late capitalist, financialized neoliberal system as if nothing has happened in between. And that in itself, I think, is a consequence of a certain prior periodization which um, looks at certain features within the capitalist system, highlights them, and creates a narrative around what has been changing inside that system. And of course, you know, the most popular account would say that we used to live in the world of free liberal capitalism until 1920s or 30s. Then we moved into the world of monopoly capitalism uh, with large enterprises, consolidation, uh, technocratic management of the economy, which in the early 1970s starts giving rise to some kind of late capitalism, which uh, is uh, characterized by financialization, privatization, and all these things partly that uh, Frederick also mentioned. I'm not sure that that narrative holds water anymore. I mean, it's a plausible one. I just don't think that that question allows us to understand and probe the question of legitimacy with which I started. Because to understand legitimacy, you do need to problematize the role of the state, the role of power, the role of culture, to an extent that this account doesn't really do. And it also needs to problematize the question of the citizen vis-a-vis -vis the political system, which um, in its own right explains why we have such a hard time understanding the rise of the so-called populist movements. Because within the framework that basically disregards the political and focuses on just the economic forces in defining stages of the capitalist transformation, it's essentially unable to detect challenges to the legitimacy of the current system. And then the former systems, which gave rise, for example, to the neoliberal challenge. I know it's a bit abstract, so let me illustrate that a little bit more with a different alternative framework that I'd like to propose you that I've been working on for many, many years that informs the book that I'm trying to finish. So before we got caught up in this dream of late capitalism, um, there was, of course, another way to think about how do you split capitalist history. And that started by assuming that we were living in the world of organized capitalism, which is something that starts in Austria, actually, with a lot of Austrian Marxists theorizing its rise, rise, marked by the rise of cartels, monopolies, and so forth which lasted, I would argue, this age of organized capitalism, right? Where the idea was that by having the state and the government get involved in creating the conditions for capitalist reproduction, we can create conditions either for socialist transformation or for full-blown communist transformation, right? Which was what Hilferding, the Austrian uh, minister and uh, Marxist theorist, initially thought that the banks will become so large that they will essentially own all the economy, they will organize it, so to say, and then all you need to do will just be to nationalize the banks, and the problem of communism would be solved. <laughs> right? That's just to illustrate what was meant by the idea of organized capitalism. Right? That in itself generated, as a system, all sorts of problems. Forget about neoliberal transformation. If you go and read leftist, progressive critiques of organized capitalism, that appear in the 1960s, including, by the way, by people like Habermas, who at that point was still much more radical than he is now, Klaus Off and many others, including you know, people like Tony Negri in Italy criticizing the uh, planning state and so forth, all of them point to structural problems in the organization of organized capitalism how the welfare state worked, how it basically paid zero attention to the social movements, how that entire apparatus was set up for failure. And it's against, and I'm reminding you again, those critiques come from the left and they attack the very Keynesian state that we are now all celebrating at the golden age to which we want to return. Right? That stuff was criticized aggressively and widely 
in the 1960s already, from the left. In the 1970s, the neoliberals roll out a different project, and they say we are going to take this organized capitalism where technocrats solve problems, and they're going to replace it with disorganized capitalism where it will be about market competition solving problems, where you will not need to justify the authority of this welfare agencies, public bureaucracies, and these public institutions, but you would be able to trust the market to solve the problem, because competition is able of aggregating information that bureaucrats cannot, you know, the famous Hayekian argument. Right? And this idea of disorganized capitalism, it maps out pretty well on the rise of globalization, on uh, many other phenomena where the idea is that by essentially breaking up all rigid fixed structures, you would be able to solve problems by essentially inserting the logic of the market into the system. I would argue that that period runs out of fuel by early 2000s because it becomes obvious that it carries a lot of costs. It starts become noticeable, including by people who would otherwise be card-carrying capitalists, you know, think of El Gore, that this is a system that generates the seeds of its own destruction. And that something needs to happen because otherwise the conditions of possibility for capitalism itself would get undermined. So capitalists start thinking really hard, what should be the solution, to what should be the successor, so to say, to disorganized capitalism? And I would argue that the system that emerges in its place and that consolidates right before the pandemic, but even more so after it, is what I would call organic capitalism. Where the idea is that you acknowledge that markets and capitalism produces a lot of problems, but since it's a system that is better than central planning that leads to gulag, Stalinism, and all the kind of boogeyman that uh, Frederick mentioned as a popular myth around communism, we need to find a way to mobilize the power of capital itself to resolve the consequences of its operations. And that's how you end up with all sorts of bizarre financial products, carbon credits, ESGs, you end up with big tech that is basically saying that, look, just give us some uh, AI and they're going to solve the problem of the climate change. We just basically need to accelerate and unleash the power of capitalism because within that power of capitalism, we would be able to solve the problems that it creates in its own right. And I think the discourse of this new type of organic capitalism is very different from what came before, in part because neoliberals themselves are much happier to acknowledge that capitalism is not perfect. It creates all sorts of problems, and they need to step in to solve them. It's only through that lens that you can understand how someone like Larry Fink, the uh, you know, CEO of BlackRock, can become the, ic the icon of progressive movement in America, saying that by mobilizing the power of financial capital, we would be able to resolve many of the problems that uh, capitalism itself has created. Right? And you think that this is an absurd proposition because he does not see that he's trying to mobilize the very system that has caused the problems to resolve its kind of uh, contradictions, but it passes, right? Again, because the legitimacy is there, and as I was hinting in my remarks just two, three or four minutes ago, the reason why this passes and why there is still legitimacy in this discourse is because neoliberals have been quite successful in saying that there is basically no alternative to the market as a system of producing innovations at scale. And saying that central planning can do that, or democratic planning can do that, it doesn't take full account of what, of the kind of almost religious awe and power that neoliberals like Hayek attribute to the power of the market. Because for them, the market, it's not a tool a platform for aggregating price data and aggregating information the way many people on the left interpret Hayek and Mises and others to be. For this neoliberalist, the market really is the core institution of modernity, 
much more important than the state, much more important than the democratic institutions that we have built, because it really allows to satisfy our deepest longings for becoming, reinventing ourselves, and doing something with this immense drive that we have to even engage in self-reflection of some kind. You know, and if you look at the figure of the entrepreneur in classical Austrian theory, Jesus, I mean, that's the more reflexive person than Bourdieu could have ever invented. That's a person who is reflecting upon everything every second and mm -hmm. is trying to uh, change their course of action, uh, exposed to a new environment based on new information. What's wrong with that? I want this kind of people to be around. Like, I see nothing wrong in the way in which the Austrian economists and Austrian theory celebrates entrepreneurs. They are fully the kind of modernist or even postmodernist subject that we want to cultivate. But surely their self-reflexiveness can be applied in domains other than capitalist accumulation, right? But obviously there are also institutional infrastructural factors that make their self-reflexiveness, you know, and what I mean self-reflexiveness, I mean something very like simple. I mean, basically they are always on the lookout for new projects, and they're always on the lookout for examining the existing means against given ends, reinventing those ends, suggesting new ends, reinventing the means. It's a complete fluid process, which I think is something we should encourage in the kind of system that we have in 2024. But the question, once again, is if capitalism allows that subjectivity to flourish, Within one specific domain of economic activity and of building things, many of which are harmful to democracy, environment, and so forth, why shouldn't we spend more time thinking how social institutions, public institutions, and the state can be mobilized to activate that kind of subjectivity in other domains? so that all of us can be experimenting and reinventing and hopefully collaborating and sharing with each other on a daily basis. And if you look at current stack of technologies that are available, including those related to artificial intelligence, it's obvious that they can be used to solve all sorts of problems that all of us experience. You know, if you really have, I mean, just look how easy it has become to code. You really don't need to spend months studying Python, you can just write the code by explaining in plain language what you want, and GPT or Claude will give it to you in 15 seconds. I don't think it's fraudulent. I think that this is wonderful because it means that all of us suddenly became empowered to be more active and reflexive in our own everyday life. The problem is that the institutions of capitalism will always channel this drive towards individual solutions. So that all of us pay $20 a year or a month for access to JetGPT, and we all reinvent the same solution uh, 5 billion times. Because that way, 5 billion users are gonna pay a Silicon Valley company to solve a problem that you can solve through a public institution once and for all at a fraction of the cost, right? And I think this is the problem. The problem is that we don't have a way to move between this ability to resolve these questions on our own and feeling excited about it. Because compared to the stale nature of organized capitalism, where you were just a passive subject of the welfare state and you couldn't do anything, you could participate in nothing, this world looks far more exciting and it does look genuinely populist because it does allow you to do things that previously you had to procure through institutions, the market, and so forth. So in some sense, it is empowerment, but it's an empowerment that's surely truncated, and it's an empowerment that's channeled towards amplifying and accelerating the process of capitalist accumulation. And the only way for us, I think, on the left, to show that this system it's not as good as it claims as to show that ultimately its costs are enormous. It's gonna kill all of us if uh, six or seven billion people start using ChatGPT to solve the individual problems. Just through energy costs, it's gonna kill us. Uh, but it also doesn't activate all of the innovative potential that we have because we have no ability to share those solutions that we find. Right? There is no collaborative element. I might be solving the problem that 
20 of you have already solved yesterday, right? So obviously this requires a degree of visibility and collectivity and publicity in our own individual projects that you can only get through a democratic system with public institutions and whatnot. But again, I think that putting that democratic element, which Frederick also, of course, spoke about, as the key driver of this new alternative system we want to build, it's a strategic and tactical mistake. Because we can only delegitimize the capitalist system by showing that it sucks at innovation. Yeah. And every single day, it's making our job easier because the potentiality of the tools that it now produces and the ability of ordinary people to use them, not about you know, tech experts or programmers, it's growing every day. And in that sense, the difference between what's possible and what's actual, it's bigger and bigger. And a smart leftist progressive project should capitalize on that. So when I hear Federic say that, you know, they talk about innovation and they talk about technology and we have to be critical about it, I mean, of course we should be, but I also don't think that we should dismiss the enormous contribution that technologies can give to whatever progressive project will emerge in its place because technologies are other than institutions. And it just so happens that in the system that we have now, Technologies are by and large a euphemism for the market as an institution, but it doesn't mean that we can't have different ones. Right? But to understand what it is that we need, I think we need to insert that alternative project into a frontal assault on what capitalism holds dearest to its heart. And I'm sorry to say it's not democracy, it's innovation. Thank you. <laughs> What comes next? Well, I hope that you were going to respond. Uh, oh, to respond, no. You have a lot of uh, yeah, work also. Yeah, um, Evgeny said so many things that I don't, I, I hardly know where to start from. Uh, you know, you brought me back to my former economist time. So that was lovely. Uh, uh, there, there will be so many things to say. Uh, so I will pick one or two things uh, among uh, all what you've said. You raised a very important issue um, when you ask how come that capitalism still enjoy legitimacy. Th th this is quite a, an important question. It turns out that I'm finishing right now a very big book uh, on psychoanalysis. Mm, well, psychoanalysis reread with Spinoza's lens. And he who has a hammer, he sees nails everywhere, of course. Um, so, when you ask the question, um, what makes the, the capitalism legitimacy, my spontaneous reply was, was that it harpoons us very deeply. Uh, it, it grabs us by our impulses and, and desires. It, it was the, 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 great, the great advance of psychoanalysis to underline the lack uh, which lies at the very core of our lives. Capitalism, to that extent, is probably in history the most potent proposition, the most potent offer to fill the lack, you know, to, to plug the gaps in our lives. Um, among the, 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 the claims of what capitalism, uh, of what capitalism uh, could deliver, there is one which you forgot uh, and which it seems to me is quite important, especially uh, in the comparison with communism. No shortage. The shelves will already be full. You know, that's, and that's very important. Not in the Austrian tradition. Mm. Because there is no equilibrium ever. 
So you'll always have shortages. Yes, you have, <laughs> but that's not the claim. You know, the, so, is it, the same Hayek among, would never subscribe to the idea. Yeah, that you know, among, yes, you're right. <laughs> we have seen that during the COVID, it was it was blatant. But uh, um, among the, the 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 mythical claims capitalism made in comparison with communism, there is there is this one, and filling the shelves, the shelves, sorry, no shortage. That mean the continuity of the feed. I think it's a notion you know pretty well, the feed, right? Um, because this claim of the continuity of the feed culminates in the social networks. The, the, you know, the, the, the proposition, the, the kind of existential proposition of capitalism is so addictive that it can hardly be relinquished. And that's the problem. And I think that's the way capitalism holds us. Um, so in the short term, it will be difficult for people to get rid of that, I think, because it's too potent. It, it's too strong. It's too strong. Uh, what can be done is to show, as you mentioned, that Capitalism sucks at, at delivering, uh, at delivering uh, this um, at a reasonable cost. And the cost is exactly what you said at the end of your talk. It, capitalism destroys nature. It destroys our lives. It destroys our mental health and so on. So it's all, as always, it's a question of balance between affects. When the, when the sad passions, I, as would say Spinoza, of the capitalist uh, costs will be high enough to offset the, the joyful effects of consumption, the joyful effects of the continuity of the continuous feed, then something will happen, but, but not before. Yet, we have to say that uh, a communist proposition cannot rely exclusively on sad passions. It has, because, you know, every political proposition is, in essence, uh, uh, an affective, a desiring proposition, too. So we will have to present communism as a, uh, an affective proposition, which is capable of grabbing people possibly as strongly as capitalism did. That's the first point. Uh, there are so many other things I, uh, I, I would have liked to discuss, um, but you know, uh, especially around the, the false claim of, um, of innovation. Um, you might have heard of the very last findings, the very last idea, I should say, imaginations of capitalists about uh, the climate change. They are all summed up under the, 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 lab, the label geoengineering. Maybe you have, you have heard about that. Geoengineering is, I don't know how to qualify it. It's really scary, you know. It's Dr. Strangelove in command. They are really sorcerers, apprentices. They are, they are keen to do anything that's, uh, that's uh, it, it, it really freaks out. Um, this is part of the, of the problem, and there lies all the, 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 the interest of what you said about mm, finding a way to um, mm, mm, abandon the idea that technology in, in, in itself is, um, is a very dangerous thing, and framing it, reframing it otherwise, but uh, accordingly with uh, non-capitalistic goals, with a non-capitalist society, as you did in the, this paper you published uh -huh. in the Monde Diplomatique, uh, which is quite interesting, and I, I had several ideas to, to discuss around it, but Maybe I've said enough, and I'll, uh, I'll let you go. Do you want me to say a few things? Um, sure. Well, I, I, I wanted to say this, but I didn't get quite around to it. Um, 
how we can define communism in a way that will open us towards this questioning of the capitalist innovation as the only innovation in town. Um, Friedrich talked about democracy, right, as the kind of underlying imaginary of uh, communism. And I think that there is, of course, another way to read communism, and it's to think about it as a system that allows each and every one of us to realize and develop our full potentials outside of whatever social, racial, cultural, and other obstacles mm -hmm. might be standing in our way. It doesn't explicitly invoke democracy, but it invokes the idea that ultimately all of us are capable of infinite number of things, mm -hmm. and we are capable of learning and developing appreciations and skills that in the former times were only available to the kind of aristocratic top layer who could enjoy fine poetry and food and mm -hmm. speak 20 languages. Mm -hmm. And of course, they had a very different perspective and appreciation of life. Their existence was much richer. And in a very idiosyncratic way, you can say that communism could actually mean that all of us regardless of the plebeian layers of society and how plebeian they are we come from, would be able to develop those kinds of appreciations and skills and we would be able to act upon the impulses and the desires that we have regardless of the class, social, cultural and other obstacles in our way. If that's how we define communism, then I do think that it becomes a slightly more appealing system mm -hmm. to the capitalist subjects that we have now, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not the ideal type abstract democratic subjects to whom, whom we hope to convince with the promise of democracy. Because if your choice is between the latest iPhone and a democratic Soviet where you can decide upon how this iPhone will be made with zero impact upon the actual manufacturing of the iPhone, outside maybe of Barcelona uh, with its fantastic participatory model, most people would opt for the iPhone. Not because they don't appreciate democracy, but because they've been subject to capitalist messaging and ideo ideologists for far too long. Right? And in that sense, I do think that we have to be realistic. And you know, as Mark Fisher used to talk about capitalist realism, we need some kind of communist realism which would actually try to work with the capitalist subjects we have and not the future communist subjects we hope to have at the end of this process. Right? And in that sense that I think there is so much work that left itself uh, needs to undertake in reformulating what it wants to accomplish and how, and how it should talk about technology, but also how it should talk about culture and how it should talk about parties and whatnot, because at the end of the day, the neoliberals made a very smart bet by saying that, look, what really matters in society is the economy. Everything else is just an input into it, right? And they've created a system where everything revolves around that. You know, we measure GDP growth, we ultimately, our entire political discourse now is reframed in those terms. And I think as tempting as it might be for materialists and people you know, inspired by Marxism to essentially say, oh, no, 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 we have our own version of the economy. And in our economy, we also count five other indicators. And we don't count 10 indicators. And we have a much better way to measure things, right? which is a campaign to reclaim the economy from the left. I'm not sure that that's the winning strategy for the left. Because all that the left has as a counterpart to the economy is not the communist economy, but rather it's communist culture, defined in a very broad set of terms when we talk about skills, aptitudes, uh, thought styles, paradigms, and whatnot. This is what the alternative to the economy is. This is where we innovate, right? And that's why I think that the job of convincing people that communism ultimately is much more 
of an innovative system that it gets credit for is that we're already extremely creative and innovative in spheres of life that are not mediated by the economy. We're innovating in our everyday life all the time. It's just that personal, interpersonal, social, and so forth. It's just that there are no structural and institutional forces in place to scale up those innovations the way capitalist system scales up the innovations of individual entrepreneurs. And what we need to be inventing is this scaling up institutions within the rest of culture that can do to acts of individual non-economic innovation what capitalism does to the acts of individual entrepreneurial economic innovation. And that doesn't mean that we'll be living in some kind of idealistic bubble where we don't need to eat and sleep and we'll just be engaged in a world of ideas. But it means that we will need to be finding models and ways to valorize this immense growth in creativity and innovation happening in our everyday life. And to some extent, I think that's one part that Silicon Valley has really mastered. Because by giving us sensors and monitoring everything we do, not just in the workplace, but in the work off hours, right? During the weekend, as we interact with each other through WhatsApp with our neighbors, they have entirely co-opted our everyday existence and all the innovations we do in our social and everyday life and found a way to valorize it within capitalist system, no doubt, but it doesn't mean that we cannot try at least to think and imagine what an alternative way to valorize all those innovations and communications would be in a communist system. But it's a far cry from saying that, look, what we need to be thinking of is how do we nationalize Google and build a data center with a slightly different ownership model. It's not about changing the signs in the ownership ledger of the economy which is the traditional impulse of the communists and the socialists, it's figuring out what's a truly alternative equivalent to the economic activity is in the realm of culture, which I think, if you buy my definition of communism, as giving all of us the capacity and the ability to develop our capabilities to the maximum, makes sense. I do buy it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I fully buy it. I would add uh, a communist proposition is also a matter of uh, institutional design to not to not to deliver a complete take it or leave it uh, um, overall blueprint for all the society, but at least to outline. Or, or sketch what an institutional design could be in the, the, the very and in the most uh, important areas. Um, that, can be, that can be done, but I've not, I've not enough time to do, to do it today. So I would like to come back to, your, to, to what you just said. Uh, you know, it's a commonplace, it has been a, a, a for long, a common place of the Western discourse on the USSR. They are Soviets, they are so hubristic, they are so crazy, that they aim at uh, reshaping the human being. They are so crazy that they had the desire of producing a new human type, you know. Well, every social formation inevitably produces its own human type. The capitalist formation, social formation did so, you know. As you said, the legacy of the capitalism is the capitalist subjectivity, and we have to deal with it. We have to deal with it. And a, 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 a smart strategy would then be to uh, find a way to minimally divert uh, this capitalist subjectivity from its path, from its trajectory, with a well-adjusted proposition, which is exactly the one you made, 
which is exactly the one Marx made. I, I didn't remember if it was in the German ideology or with Engels in the, in the manifesto. But it's an empowerment proposition, of course. It's an empowerment proposition both uh, at, on the, uh, at the um, political collective level and from an individual standpoint. Needless to say, the, the idea that, uh, Marx's idea that communism will um, give way to the total man, you know, the man that has exploited and realized the, uh, on the, f the, the full scale of its potentialities, this idea uh, might be somewhat flawed, but there is, uh, there is a core of truth in it, and, and that's what we, we should rely on. I also agree, so <laughs> <laughs> everything is nice. I think we are going to collect uh, a couple of questions from the audience, and we will do them together, okay? Uh, because they think very quickly, so they can accept a few ones. And then we will close because it's just an hour. Yeah. Um, yeah, can I? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, Morozov, um, I, I really liked the way you brought this idea of uh, bringing this new alternative. And nowadays we are in the society of attention. So maybe a way to leverage uh, the way that people get recognized or get this value uh, can come from that. So for example, nowadays it happens, but it happens on like companies like YouTubers making videos and then they get lots of views and lots of uh, like people are following them and then they get money from YouTube or from advertisements and TikToks also. So this is kind of happening, like somehow, but it's mediated by these big techs. Mm -hmm. And an alternative to bring this, like this idea of leveraging the skills of people to give them some value contribution can be to try to find a ways to connect that with institutions because we are in this crisis of institutions. And I, I haven't seen, maybe if you, if you have uh, seen or thought something about that, um, could you share with us like, how can we connect the institutions and this moment that we are in this big crisis of institutions with these big techs uh, to find a way from like, uh, with a bureaucratic, a bureaucratic design or process to leverage people's skills and making them being valuable but not only mediated by big techs as it's happening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Uh, yes, boys, some women want to ask also. Yo haré la pregunta en castellano porque el inglés me da bastante mal. Varias preguntas. Bueno, primero todo daros las gracias por la por la exposición. Luego. I will take okay. Notes for okay. Vale. Perfecto. Ah, luego me gustaría saber eh, por qué únicamente miramos las alternativas desde un punto de vista marxista, olvidando corrientes como pueden ser el anarquismo, por ejemplo, y sobre todo posturas de las de Murray Bookkin, que apuestan por un poscapitalismo real donde, eh, por ejemplo, la clase trabajadora quede liberada al 100% del trabajo a través de la automatización de puestos de trabajo. Entonces, imaginaros un mundo poscapitalista, también implicaría imaginarse un mundo posttrabajo donde la clase trabajadora demande la liberación de un trabajo subyugado a las lógicas del capitalismo. Mm -hmm. do you need, you, you, I need translation. Ah, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, I can do it if you don't. Another one. You yeah. want to translate for him? No, no, I took notes, so I'm going to show them to you. Yeah. And a post work world can be. And book, book, book chain. Book chain. Okay. A post work world. Oh, yeah. Can okay. Be mm -hmm. Is there a third question? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, very interesting conversation. Um, it seems to be, to me, a discussion about the same path, but one acknowledging that rigidity of systems is, a, is an issue, and the other that are kind of human innovation and agility and fluidity 
at a personal social level can be leveraged and scaled up into uh, something to rival that of um, uh, yeah, free market capitals, tech sector, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which is really interesting. The word that kept coming to mind while you were both speaking was that it, it sounds to me, and, I, and maybe you can comment on whether I'm understanding this correctly or interpreting correctly, it sounds to me like we're, we're, we're talking about a kind of an open sourcing of human innovation, and that open sourcing in the tech sense uh, obviously is this sort of sharing community uh, aspect to, to tech. And it's also got a kind of a, a benign but very powerful Darwinian force where good ideas float to the top. And it sounds to me that if you were to take this sort of open source spirit and be able to channel it and give it structures and, inst you know, and institutions around it and empower the common good and empower the everyday person, um, through some form of open source civic participation. Is that what we think a scaled up version of participatory democracy could look like? Um, but agility, fluidity, and um, being able to go as fast as our competitors, because at the moment, the system of capital is uh, incredibly agile and fluid and it is just completely outrunning the, uh, the big rigid institutions. So my thoughts, or my, my question is really open source. Do you think that that's a useful analogy? Mm -hmm. Should we? All right, I, mean, I can start with the O3. Um, so the first question on the the economy of attention and the way in which um, you know YouTube and TikTok and others already function uh, as a way of stimulating creativity. I guess uh, I, I think we have to understand that to some extent. I mean, it's a very dialectical and kind of very nice Marxist example in, in that. I mean, of course, within them, as with many capitalists systems and enterprises, you have the seeds of a next alternative regime popping up. And there are definitely valuable signs of what an alternative regime might look like. So the idea that now you have people sharing tips on how to solve problems and sharing tips on you know, how to learn a language, and uh, it's great. I mean, it's, it's a fantastic resource that solves many of the problems that traditional hierarchical modernist institutions of the organized capitalism had, where you would have a preacher slash expert sort of communicating from the top. I'm not minimizing the role that conspiracies and you know vaccine negationists might play within such a system and how it might give rise to all sorts of pathological phenomena. But I think by and large, there are extremely valuable elements within it. But of course, and this is one aspect where I think the Frankfurt School and Habermas and Adorno and Horkheimer were kind of right. I mean, the fact that these systems operate uh, subjugated to the logic of advertising within the capitalist media system results in distorting the direction in which many of these projects would go, right? And many of the YouTubers who start as this genuine, uh, authentic uh, individuals sharing their perspective on the world, you know, end up turning into capitalist startups who just have to churn out content 24 seven, right? And then combined with the recommendation algorithms, you end up uh, in these bizarre situations where you're reinforcing sameness by means of variety, which is paradoxical, right? But that's where you get. And instead, we should be reinforcing variety by means of variety and not reinforcing sameness, right? And again, that happens because advertising drives the entire system and you need to monetize eyeballs and you need to serve us more of what we want because that way you monetize clicks. So it's a system of anti-becoming. Right? And that's one element on which you can go and frontally attack capitalism. 
and say that in this digital incarnation, you know, this like a fully, it, it doesn't get more imminent when it comes to imminent critique than this. You know, if capitalists promise us a sense of perpetual becoming, how come my YouTube recommendations are always the same and presume that I will be the same man every day for the next 25 years and I need to be watching this three Perry Anderson videos? I, I mean, right? And again, that is tied to me being me and them monetizing me as me because they don't want to take the risk that I might become someone else the way an institution in public education or culture might, to get back to your institution's question, right? There is no risk because risk entails costs and capitalists don't want to risk with our subjectivity as long as our subjectivity is already profitable for them. So on that plane, I think capitalism loses. So in a communist system, it, that problem would be solved somewhat differently because you'll have a different set of mediators curating your flow of becoming, so to say. The question on work and blockchain and kind of whether we are drawing too much on Marx and Marxism or not enough on anarchism. Um, I mean, as much as I love blockchain and I've read quite a few of his work, and I cite him actually in, in, in one of the pieces I've done for the New Yorker more than a, a decade ago, which is the first time anybody mentioned Bookchin in the New Yorker article. Uh, I do think that his concerns, as the concerns of many Marxists, by the way, come from a very peculiar era, which is 1950s, 1960s, this you know, height of Fordist organized capitalism where work for them primarily meant work in factories which was dreadful, alienating, and it was horrifying. And of course, you wanted to automate that and uh, have a life where you wouldn't need to go to the factory at 9 a.m. Um, that in itself, I think it's, it's a problematic, I mean, it has to do, you know, we, we can have a debate, maybe it's Friedrich on this later on, but ultimately it has to do with a certain ambiguity in Marx's own thought and interpretations of Marx later on as to what exactly is meant by work and labor, right? Mm -hmm. And whether uh, when we mean labor, we are, are just talking about transforming reality and nature, or whether we are talking about something that actually produces value within some kind of socioeconomic system, which might be automatable. But if we are talking about the reality of the human transforming nature into some, in, in, within some kind of intersubjective flow, I, you know, moving to a post-work society would mean becoming a kind of a brain in the wet, right? Meaning that becoming someone who doesn't interact with reality because you're not transforming it in any way. It's like, would be, you'll be like chat GPT in a sense, right? You will be able to respond to questions, but you're dead. <laughs> so in that sense, no, I don't want that kind of post-work society. If work in that post-work is the work that, you know, and labor that Marx had in mind originally when he described work as transformation of nature. If we're talking about factories of 1950s, sure, let's, get them over with, right? So in that sense, and I'm just not sure that Bookchin arrives to that level of sophistication and, and, and the analysis of Marx. He's basically saying, yeah, this factory suck and we need something better, and I agree with him. Uh, but surely if you look at enough of, let's say, autonomous tradition and many of the post-work, you know, uh, uh, Andre Gors and any, many other people in France, you'll find the same resources within the Marxist tradition. You don't need to look to Bokchin or anarchism, although you know, I appreciate them as, as resources. And the final question on open sourcing, I, I mean, it's important to understand, for example, why I'm pushing this agenda, right? And I'm not pushing it because I want more participatory democracy. Like, I'm not saying it's bad, <laughs> but it's not the primary reason. Um, I am pushing this agenda because I think that ultimately a leftism and a Marxism that respects profound creative potential that exists in human culture uh, would be a more likely system to appeal to people who currently fall for capitalism. So, and what I would like to develop is an institutionally robust system 
that takes our little individual acts of creative resistance and innovation and turns them into something that is far more glorifying and less ecologically destructive than what capitalist enterprise does. That, of course, would require all sorts of governance mechanism, democratic deliberation, and so forth. But I think putting those institutions sort of first rather than second, it's like putting the cart before the horse. And, and that was kind of part of my subtle critique to Frederic, because ultimately, if the idea is that we're going to take the capitalist economy, and I'm not saying that he said that, but like you could interpret him that way. If the idea is that we take the capitalist economy and socialize everything within it, and then we're just going to have Soviets and a more democratic system on top of that, I'm not sure it's going to appeal to people, and I'm not sure like that's what we need. So in that sense, putting the democratic question first, I, I just really think it's more utopian than we deserve. Which doesn't answer the open sourcing, but I guess you can work your way from there, because ultimately, the features you pointed out in open source, they're really the features of a democratic system, regardless of the fact that, you know, the way actual open source projects work can feature plenty of hierarchy and authoritarian control. Well, I, I, I'm afraid I, I can't reply about open source and big takes, but I have one or, I can say one or two things on uh, Bookshin and post-work uh, alternative. Um, just to add a, a couple of things uh, to what uh, Evgeny has just said about Bookshin. Uh, I, find he, I find him quite, quite interesting. It's a figure of, you know, he, he's, a, he's a figure of an impure strand of an anarchism, I would say. He's rather a figure of something like a libertarian communism. Um, by the way, um, he, you know, his ideas had, had varied quite a lot uh, during his life. Um, he was very interesting in considering, you know, in a very anarchist way, a federation of autonomous communities. But uh, as time went by, he paid more and more attention to the institutional framework, I mean the, the, the institution upon the, the, the connections and the relationships, the horizontal relationships between the autonomous communities, I mean. So he put some verticality into his horizontality, so, so to speak. And to that extent, I find him quite interesting because I don't share the, mm, the pure horizontalist postulates of, uh, of anarchism. Where I differ from uh, Bookchin is about his views on uh, the, the diffusion process or the transition process uh, towards his communism. Because as you know, he, his idea is that, um, well, uh, a small community will appear somewhere, then another one, then another one, then they will connect with one another, then their relationships will be uh, uh, denser and denser, and the process will go on, and eventually uh, it's, it's done, that's it. The entire country is covered with interconnected communities, and communism is, is realized. You know, I don't share this view. I, I think it's quite naive. Uh, just capitalists won't let that happen. You know, that's quite clear. I have in mind a memory of an, an, an horizontal experience of workers uh, who had taken over their own company. They were pro producing on, uh, on a self-organized basis, selling the products, Paying themselves, it was um, a clock manufacturer, Leap, you know. 
it was a very small it, it was a very small thing you know somewhere in, in France in the country in the country countryside but the power didn't let that happen it killed the initiative and he, he had the means to, to, to do so so butching transition process seems to me quite unlikely about post-work alternative, uh, I would just make a small variation around what uh, Evgenis has just said. It depends on what you mean by work, you know. If by work and the fact of having to work you mean material reproduction, it is clear that material repro reproduction is a concern for every community. Every community has to deal with its own material reproduction. In that sense, people in that community have to work. Now, if you consider work under a more rigorous sense, a you know, more rigorous meaning, the meaning given by Marx, work can be defined as the human, product, the, the human productivity, productive activity, insofar as it is embedded in the capitalist relationships, which means uh, the double separation, the workers are separated from the means of production, the workers are separated with the product of the productions, and the labor force is sold on the, uh, on the labor market, as it is called, and the, the, the core, the core of, of, of work within capitalism is the employer-employee relationship under the rule of the private ownership of the means of production. It is quite clear that transitioning to communism just means breaking with all that you know, but not with the imperative of material reproduction. As Marx said, I don't remember where, uh, uh, a seven-year-old child perfectly knows that if a society stops working, I mean stops producing, stops uh, investing uh, its activity into the, the material reproduction, if it stops to do that, it will perish in hardly more than a week or a decade. So, well, we will have to, there is, you know, there is a post-work alternative in the capitalist sense of work, but there is none in the sense of having to produce our material lives. Okay, so it's done, so... Thank you very much. Just a last minute update for tomorrow. We have a cancellation from the people from Canada, so for those coming tomorrow at uh, 9 a.m. we will have two workshops and one will be the one made by the people from OSP uh, related with the right a API capabilities and also at the same time we will have the workshop made by the people from Brazil uh, on how to integrate the survey component with the CDIM. So that's all for today. Thank you very much.